Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Um, what I was going to do is address myself to two basic myths. One, the myth that we have a free and independent press and media. And two, the myth that it's a liberal press. Um, and then I'll also say something about entertainment media because it's part of the, it's an extension of it. After I wrote Inventing Reality, I realized there's a, when you look at television, there's the other 85% of television which has nothing to do with the, the press or the, or the news media, and that's the entertainment field. So I wrote another book called Make Believe Media about the entertainment media, and I'll say something about that also. First, I'd like to point out that uh, our free, quote, free and independent press is neither all that free nor is it all that independent. For one thing, if you work in the news core, you find that there's a lot of government censorship. Uh, an enormous amount of government documents of information is classified. You can't get to it. So that means that in our democracy, there are people that are doing all sorts of things that one can't really find out and hold, uh, and for which they can't hold them accountable. There's an innate dependence on government sources when you're in the media. Um, the press corps, the Washington press corps, it depends. The, the, the government official them, uh, controls literally the lifeblood of that media, which is information. And they can let it flow or they can withhold it. And uncooperative reporters often get punished. They don't get, they get the false information, no story breaks, or they're frozen out of travel pools or things like that. Cooperative reporters are rewarded. They get insiders, scoops, special appointments. They often get government appointments uh, also. In fact, what you find, rather than adversarial thing of a free and independent press challenging the government, questioning government, what you find is a remarkable collusion between government and media. So what's what uh, we've called the revolving door between government and media. You have people like Leslie Gelb, Ben Bradley, uh, most of the top management leadership of the Copley uh, uh, newspaper chain, all having worked for the FBI, uh, 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 for the CIA. FBI also has their pet journalists and columnists. J. Edgar used to feed stories to favorite journalists, to plant stories and, and whatever else. Um, but they worked for the CIA for a long time. The church committee discovered that over 500 journalists were also in the pay of the CIA. In some cases, they were reporters who were recruited by the CIA. In other cases, they were CIA people who posed as journalists in, in various operations and things. Um, <clears throat> Diane Sawyer. Diane Sawyer is a very good case. She worked in the, in the Nixon administration. When Nixon got kicked out of office in disgrace, resigned, she went off with him to San Clemente and, and, and stayed there for two years with, with Pat and Dick to help him write his uh, autobiography. And then she came back uh, out of government and then is in the media now and works for ABC and is a big, uh, what do you call it, anchor woman, whatever you want to call it, a host of a show. Pat Buchanan. Pat Buchanan has been, his entire work life has been either working in the Nixon administration, Reagan administration, either working in government or working in news media uh, as a journalist and columnist, government media, journalist, and column. In other words, in his whole life, he hasn't had an honest job. I mean, that's really <laughs> terrible, you know. So the latest example is Pete Williams. I don't know if any of you saw Panama Deception, the uh, documentary film that won the Academy Award, um, which, you know, I signed a petition because the film was suppressed in Panama. They wouldn't show it. But we shouldn't overlook the fact that the film has been suppressed in the United States. It wasn't exactly government that suppressed it, but you can't get it on the networks. We, it's shown in one or two PBS, local PBS stations. Um, I have a vested interest because I'm in the film. For, and who knew I was going to be in the Academy Award film? So you're looking at a star here. Um, <clears throat> also in the film is one Pete Williams, who was the Pentagon spokesperson. And we'd come on, we'd have cuts of him, he'd come on and he'd say, I have heard of no such thing of Panamanian civilians getting killed like that. And then we'd cut to a shot of all these bodies lying there and the things blowing up and this and that. And, he, I, and back to Pete Williams, I have heard, no, that hasn't happened all that. So here was this Pentagon flack, you know, 
worked for the government, and now he is NBC national reporter. So how free and independent? These guys with this revolving door. And then sometimes, in the case of Leslie Gelby, went from the government to the Washington, no, the New York Times, back into the government and back to the Times. I mean, uh, <clears throat> now if this happens in a totalitarian country, you say, look at that. If you say, if you said, you know, in Soviet Russia, you had people in working for Pravda who then were in the KGB and then worked for Pravda again or then went in, into some other ministry. You say, wow, you can say, see, they don't have a free and independent press. They, they're all just kind of in bed together there. Well, we got the same kind of thing here, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say. <clears throat> but most of the censorship isn't even government censorship. Most of the censorship that goes on in the media is actually done by the media themselves, by the publishers, the editors, uh, and the like. <clears throat> That's another control. <clears throat> in fact, the media often is quite happy and accepts government censorship. During the Gulf War, when the army and when the uh, U.S. military put that put the clamps down on all press, nobody could go out and look for themselves and whatever else. Uh, Tom Brokaw said, "Well, they were burned. The military was burned in Vietnam, and now they're being cautious, and you can't blame them." I thought that was kind of a remarkable statement to make for a pressman to say, I don't mind the government censorship. I'll take whatever handouts they give me, whatever they say about the war and how it's going, what it's about and all that, that's what I will simply write. And so you have what some people have called the stenographers of, for power, that the media becomes the guys who write whatever the State Department says ABC, it's ABC. The next day the line changes to uh, uh, XYZ, then it's XYZ. <clears throat> the, the, uh, what I'm saying then is that the major form of news control can be found in the structure of the news organizations themselves. The major media, and by the major media I mean the New York Times, the Washington Post, and by the way they have national syndicates. When you, when you, I did an op editorial for the New York Times once and a friend in Denver, Colorado, uh, Two, I've had two op, op, edit, two op editorials in New York Times. The first one I had a fight for about a month against, uh, against uh, the superior editor who tried to censor the, the other editor to finally get the thing in. I had to rewrite it three times and it finally came out on a Saturday paper. But then a friend of mine in Denver, Colorado said, uh, hey, I saw your op editorial in Denver Post. And you realize that the New York Times has a whole syndicated, and you don't get, by the way, you don't get any reprint permission uh, fees for it your writers, that you have to sign away that. LA Times, the same thing, you sign it away. So they can use it and reprint it all sorts of places and resell it dozens of times and the writer doesn't get a penny for it. Um, so the LA, the LA Times, Washington Post has a national syndicate, the New York Times has a national syndicate. Uh, by the major media, that's what I mean. Those two papers and the Wall Street Journal and NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN. That pretty much is what we're talking about when we're talking about the major news media. And most of the other newspapers are spin-offs. I mean, they use or feed in to those lines. And the major news services, Associated Press, UPI, and Reuters. Now, those major media are not close to corporate America. They're not friendly to corporate America. They are corporate America. I mean, they are integral components of corporate America. NBC is owned by General Electric. Now, how many great fighting exposés are you going to see on defense contracts and NBC uh, documentaries and all, and, and NBC TV when it's owned by General Electric? Um, all these media are owned by multi-billionaires, uh, the Grams, the Hearst family, Newhouser, Knight Ritter, Gannett, uh, in the newspaper business, you have newspapers and not only, the big chains are not only buying up small independents, they're buying up other chains. And so the, le the degree and level of concentration is getting greater and greater. Uh, 90, something like 95, it changes every year, it was 91, 94, it's 95, it's probably 97 by now. Of all <clears throat> cities, don't have competing newspapers. So you get one 
one information. When you do have more than one newspaper, they almost all run from mildly centrist to, uh, to mildly conservative, or maybe outright right-winger. And those owners do not hesitate. The, the major media and the major networks are run by boards of trustees. The boards, uh, boards of directors, they're called. Boards of trustees are, are university. Same guys. They literally are often the same guys. They are, ha they are manned by the people who inhabit these boards of directors are overwhelmingly drawn from the major corporations and banks in America. If you look at CBS's board of directors, you have representatives from Ford Motor Company, from Chase Manhattan Bank, from ITT, and, 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 and various uh, other. So the influence of these major corporations in the economy, the multi-billion dollar businesses, extends also to the influence they exercise directly in the media. DuPont owns the chains of newspapers. Copley, Salzburger, Punch Salzburger of the New York Times. Old man Salzburger has a computer. He's retired now. His son is even more conservative than he is. Has a computer on his desk and would call up every day the editorials that are going in the next day. This idea that these, you talk to editors, they don't, they, they won't give you that. Are you telling me, I have you know that I'm completely independent? Well, you work for Salzburg, you'll find out something different. He can call up the editorials every morning, uh, every afternoon for the next morning, and he will change. If anything he doesn't like, boom, he beeps in, and, and he'll even look at the front page. And if he doesn't like a story, he'll say, kill it, or put it back, cut it, this, that, the other thing, spike it. Um, and that goes on all the time. Top-down control of information and news. Now, reporters, Reuben Murdoch, by the way, was interviewed. I saw an interview of him in Vanity Fair. It was very interesting because they said to him, you know, he's buying up news media, TV stations, radio stations, and they say to him, well, do you, you're known as a, <clears throat> a right-wing conservative. Are you, uh, do you, do you have your opinions, do they, uh, do you allow your opinions then to, uh, to, do you exercise an opinion influence over your publications? And I thought the guy was going to say, no, I respect the autonomy and professionalism of my editors and journalists and all that. He said, of course I do. He, says, he said, I'm not a right winger, so I'm a radical conservative, which means even more conservative than, than that. He said, and you bet. He says, the buck stops with me, yes. <clears throat> do, you, do, uh, do, you, do, you, uh, do you leave your conservative influence on your publications? And he says, yes, indeed. Reporters and editors who don't comply with that eventually run into problems. Reporters worry about getting their copy cut. They get passed over for promotion. They get reassigned to, uh, you know, some Siberia desk or something. Uh, and, and they get off the, the juicy stories or they don't get them or whatever else. And they have these problems. Oddly enough, if you talk to most reporters, most of the reporters I know who have given me stories about censorship, about top-down control and all, are ex-reporters. They're often people, I began noticing, well, I used to work for Associated Press, or well, I used to work for CBS, well, I used to. The ones who are still in there absolutely vehemently deny that there's any such thing like this. They get very indignant. They say, are you telling me that I'm not my own man? I'll have you know that in 17 years with this paper, I always say what I like. And I say to them, you say what you like because they like what you say. And you know, the minute you move too far and you have no sensation of a restraint on your freedom, I mean, you don't know you're wearing a leash if you sit by the peg all day. It's only if you then begin to wander to a prohibited parameter that you feel the tug, you see. So you're free because your, <clears throat> your ideological perspective is coterminous with, uh, congruent with that of your boss. So you have no sensation of, of being at odds with your boss, you see. Others will tell you, though, yeah, you can be censored. Others will say you have to have very finely attuned antenna to just how far you can go or not go, and you're, otherwise you'll run into trouble. And we're talking here, you know, of... Um, really very subtle process of socialization. The boss doesn't necessarily come down and say, you write what I like, and if you don't do that, although I have, I have examples in Inventing Reality, second edition, of a few choice 
cases like that where the owner says, you will not say anything ne negative about any Republican candidate that will not be allowed in the press during the entire campaign, this, that you will not say anything positive um, about any Democratic candidate. I mean, sometimes you get that, but generally that isn't the way it works. What will happen is somebody will mosey over to you at the water cooler and say, you know, don't get over involved in your story here, or you don't get run off becoming a cause person, or you've got to be objective. And objective means, objectivity means taking the world as officialdom says it is. Objectivity means not bringing up troublesome uh, information that might cause discomfort to people of power and position especially economic power, especially big corporate advertisers who pay our bills and the like. Nicholas Johnson, former uh, uh, commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, said there are four stages that journalists go through. In the early stage, you're a young crusader and you write a uh, expose story about the powers they be and you bring it to your editor and the editor says, no, kill it, we can't touch that, too hot. Stage two, you get an idea for the story, but you don't write it, and you check with the editor first, and he says, no, it won't fly. No, I don't think the old man won't like it. Uh, don't do that. He has a lot of friends in there, and, and that would get, might get messy. Stage three, you get the idea for the story, and you yourself dismiss it as silly. Stage four, you no longer get the idea for that kind of an expose story. And I would add, at stage five, you then appear on panels with media critics like me, and you get very angry and indignant when we say that there are biases in the media, and you're not as free and independent as you think. And those biases, as I'm saying, are not liberal biases. They actually move in a conservative direction. Another control besides these rich conservative owners, all, overwhelmingly all of whom are conservative Republicans, is the advertisers. Advertising. I mean, you know, uh, they say journalists are people who write on the back of advertisements. And uh, look at you, if you think that's such a joke, look at your newspaper next time and, and just do a rough content analysis. You're turning the pages. How much of it is actual copy and how much of it is advertising? How much of it is news copy and how much of it is advertising copy? Um, <clears throat> Salzberger, Norman, Norman Bauman uh, uh, did a study and he quoted Salzberg as saying, for years the New York Times could not write a story that was critical of the automotive industry, that it was unsafe and this and that. A young lawyer about, uh, about almost 30 years ago now, a young lawyer in Washington did, a, did an expose, an investigation of automobiles, he, and he wrote up a whole expose about how unsafe they were, how dangerous they were, da everything from dashboards to visibility. He couldn't get that story published in a single major media. His name was Ralph Nader. Nobody had ever heard of him, but the story was interesting. He had to publish it in a little obscure magazine called Fact Magazine. Then it got picked up here, got picked up. He finally wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, which became a bestseller. So then Congress couldn't annoy, uh, uh, ignore it, and they had hearings and all this sort of thing. But he couldn't get it in. And one of the people, Salzberger was a typical example. He had a rule, nothing in the New York Times that's critical of the automotive industry ever. Why? He was very clear. They are our biggest account. Ford, GM, and Chrysler were our biggest account in those days. This was before Toyota and Japanese took over much of it. Todd Gitlin interviewed uh, network bosses, NBC, CBS, and he talks to one. He records an interview he has in one of his books, and he asked the guy, uh, do advertisers influence the content of your TV shows, programs? You know, and again, I thought the guy was going to give the usual blather well, it's a, it's a pressure we could feel now and then, but we have our professional standards and we have keep our autonomy and all that. I thought that that's what he was going to say. He said, you betcha, absolutely. Hey, yes, all the time. Are you kidding? Of course, they pay the bills. Yes, sir, we always check with them on things. And I'll give you some examples later on when I talk about the entertainment industry. Um, so when people talk about a free market of ideas in our democracy, Please remember that it's not a free, that conjures up an image of a lot of little bizarre, uh, uh, little uh, stalls at a bazaar. You know, when you walk along and you can choose something from this one, choose from that, or choose from the other. Um, it's more like the free market of commodities in America, which is a market that's highly controlled by a small number of giant producers uh, with, with uh, other things left really at the margin, and that's pretty much it. 
if you've got the billions of bucks, you can break major uh, uh, audiences. If you don't have it, you can't. You will find, if you do anything, whether you write something or you put a film together or whatever else, in, in a capitalist system, they'll sell you the typewriter, they'll sell you the computer, they'll sell you the video camera, they'll do all that, and you can make whatever you want. The trick then is getting distribution, and that becomes the hard thing, and you'll find that the channels of distribution are controlled by very big people, and they will decide. The trick also sometimes is in, is in doing the story, raising the funds to be able to make whatever the documentary or the movie you might want to do. Um, but in that sense, it's not a free market. Those who expend vast amounts of capital will be able to reach mass audiences, those who have access to vast amounts of capital. And that becomes a form of censorship, market control. <clears throat> In addition, I would say the political culture itself, the dominant political culture, is not a, a neutral entity. It is something that is developed uh, by schools, by universities, by government, by the social sciences, and, and by the media. And the media finds confirmation for the images it propagates and the images that it's already propagated. And so what you've got really is this background, uh, this accumulated reservoir of images, which by the way, I think much of what we call culture is that, the impacted accumulated reservoir of images that are produced not by neutral institutions, but by very powerful and interested institutions. It's what Alvin Guldner called the background assumptions, or Carl Becker called it. And Carl Becker, Alvin Guldner, he, Becker called it the, the climate of opinion back in the 30s. That's become an ordinary term now, but it was his original concept, I think. And then the argument was that anything you see, any bit of information you see, the persuasiveness, your readiness to accept it, depends less on the data and the argument that's made then, then on whether or not it is congruent with, with the background assumptions that you already have about what is, um, what is okay and what isn't okay. In other words, what I'm saying is that supply creates demand. That it's not just, we always think of demand creating supply, it often works the other way around. Something you might think about. Uh, I, I was being interviewed in Seattle, Washington, uh, and a radio journalist says, well, uh, why, if, there were, if there were progressive, iconoclastic, more critical viewpoints, and if the people were interested in see, hearing them, they would hear them, and then these other publications would, uh, would sell more. Why doesn't, say, the nation sell more? It's because people aren't interested in reading it. And if you had a winning formula, you'd be okay. I said, well, you know, back during the turn of the century, there was McClure's, there was a number of uh, muckraking magazines that these fighting journalists had published, and they were getting tremendous circulation. And the guy who was also there, some, some mainstream academic communications guy said, well, heck, if those things were there and they knew they could make a buck on it, they would, they would go out there and, um, they would go out there and uh, produce those magazines and sell them. I said, no, they wouldn't. Not if those magazines were writing things that were embarrassing to their interests. Those muckraking magazines, in fact, were embarrassing to the interests of the powers that be. And Morgan, J.P. Morgan, and Rockefeller came along, and Mellon came along, and they bought them all up and said, the people are tired of muckraking and exposés about the rich and powerful. Bought the magazines all up and totally changed them or closed them down. Fired all the editors and the staff and revamped them. And that's what happened. And the Nation magazine, as I explained to that journalist, I said, the reason why USA Today can, in two years, become the third biggest selling national newspaper in the country is um, that Gannett was behind it. And Gannett put in hundreds of millions of dollars every year. So that suddenly, in, 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 in a few months, you had on every corner a, a, a little, a little magazine distributor rack there when you get USA Today. Most Americans have never even heard of the nation. I will wager, I won't ask for a show of hands, I will wager there are even some people in this highly informed audience who have never heard of the nation. And the nation has been around for over a hundred years. But the difference is that the nation doesn't have hundreds of millions of dollars to make mass market outreaches and, and, uh, and do that sort of thing. So that supply is one of the things that helps create demand. The first condition of all consumption is the accessibility of the commodity. 
You could ask any business person or any marketing person, if you think you're going to just produce something and just sit there and wait for the public to beat a door, uh, to beat a path to your door and, and buy the thing, you're wrong. You then have to go out and give it visibility and make it accessible. I remember the soft drink industry. When I was a kid, soft drinks were, well, soft drinks, they were called soda pop in those days. Soda pop was considered something not very healthy for you. It was something you drank maybe at picnics or ball games or something, or birthday party, you'd have some. And with the advent of television in the early 1950s, the soda pop companies started calling themselves soft drinks, and they started advertising on TV, and they started showing family-sized bottles and getting them into the um, supermarkets. And suddenly there were dispenser machines that you could find in the lobby of any bank, any school, any place, in the, they're everywhere, right? And the sales of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and, and all those drinks went skyrocketing up. There'd be shots of ads and, and TV, you'd see families sitting together with these big Pepsi-Cola bottles, drinking it with their food. I mean, I don't know, I'll bet, again, no show of hands, but I'll bet some of you are guilty of that, drinking that rot gut soft drink the stuff that, that uh, rots your guts and your teeth, drinking it, it's now be, it's gone from a novelty drink to a staple. I mean, it's become a, uh, a national drink, sort the soft drinks are. That, my friends, was done by, not because people, some, something happened to, there was a funny generation that came along in 1950, they just got a craze for soft drinks. Said, oh, I'm gonna have more of it. That was done by deliberately changing the tastes of the American public and changing the taste by exposing them to a whole set of images and accessibility of making the supply create the demand by making that supply so imminent and so uh, right there up front in front of people until they get hooked on the sugar in it and they drink it like maniacs now. All right. I disapprove of soft drinks. I just want you to know. It's often nice to make that point. If you're talking in a class, it's often nice to make that point because invariably, or if it's a lecture hall where you have those, you know, those armrest seats where you take notes, invariably there'll be one or two cans and I, I could point them out and, and you see the person starts to squirm and giggle and all that sort of thing. But nobody brought a soft drink in, huh? So we won't. They're probably under the seats there somewhere. There also, I would say, is very little ideological diversity in the media, despite the fact that you have a great variety of outlets. Uh, you have a lot of newspapers. You go across the country, you find the same columnists in all these newspapers and the same commentators, and they are overwhelmingly conservative. They're the same thing on TV. John McLaughlin, a right-wing commentator, has three TV shows, one in the networks and one in PBS, or two in the networks, one in PBS, William Buckley, Pat Buchanan, George Will, Evans and Novak, uh, with a sprinkling on the left, the left being people like Michael Kinsley. That's about as far left as you go. Kinsley once turned to Buchanan and said, a, a moment of great truth, I thought, he said, I'm not as far left as you are far right. And I said, yay, yay, that's for sure. That there's the polit political spectrum is, is pretty much amputated, amputated at around center. It's really center versus right. And witness the fact, for instance, that almost all the debate on major policies are debates of the center versus the right. The health plan today, the whole health plan de debate is between those who want Clinton's managed competition and those who don't want anything very much at all, the Republican right. And, and the single payer stuff has just been ruled out. It was declared at the beginning, it won't have a chance. It's just defined, even though polls showed that overwhelming majorities of Americans would go for a single payer Canadian type plan once they know what it's about. Um, and often there is an appearance of diversity. You may get two people debating a subject, McNeil Lair, they'll say, here we have two, you know, Elliot Abrams versus Sam Nunn on defense. Sam Nunn, who says we've got to keep a strong military and keep the spending at this level. Elliot Abrams, who says we've got to spend yet even more. And some of us sit there and say, what about the guy who says we should have drastic cuts with major conversion plans to, to, to convert this to civilian economy, where so many things need to be done, where so many things need to be built, a rational mass transit system, and this and that, you know, reallocation of, of, of tens of billions of dollars. You don't hear that. That guy is, is, cut, is cut off. Um, 
Nightline once had Richard Burke and Richard Pearl on, one of them supporting the Reagan hardline anti-communist policy, another one saying it wasn't hardline enough and was getting soft toward the, toward the Russians. McNeil Laird now does have one, quote, progressive commentator on, Erwin Knoll, after much agitation and pressure. But whenever he's on, he's on with five other people, and he only gets about a half a minute. I know from my own experiences, I've been on C CNBC, cable NBC, I've been on Crossfire twice. It's horrible, horrible. You sit there and you got one, one right winger here, it was, it was Robert Novak and, and, uh, and uh, Reed Irvine of AIM here, and they're screaming at you, both of them shouting, and you can't finish a sentence. I remember turning to Novak, I said, is this a screaming match or are you gonna let me finish a sentence? He said, we'll let you finish a sentence, but first we have to break for a commercial. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and that's the way it is. When I wrote Inventing Reality, the National Enquirer, my one moment of my Andy Warhol, one moment of total national media glory, the National Enquirer, you know the rag that you see the supermarkets? <laughs> it calls me up and, said, and the guy says, Mr. Parenti, we want to do a story on you and your book, The National, uh, the Inventing Reality. I said, in the National Enquirer, I say, hello? And my, he says, yes, could you tell us this? And the kind of questions he's asking, it's very interesting, you know, you're sort of caught, you have to give the interview. He said, he said I said, you know, I don't want to talk to you. I know what you're going to come up with. He says, well, if you talk to me or don't talk to me, we're going to come up with it anyway. <laughs> and he says, and so you might as well be able to try to get your two cents in, you know? So, you know, they got you hooked. So you say, no, 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 I'm no, that's not what happened. That isn't what I said. This is what I said. No. Well, it finally came out in the National Enquirer and it was a whole half a page. The bottom half was ads. And here was this whole half a page. And it said, professors teach hatred of America. And I, my jaw dropped. And there were two pictures there, a picture of me, and a picture of Karl Marx, both of us next to us. <laughs> and then there was a graphic on the other side of the, of the picture. The graphic consisted of an outline map, an outline map of the United States, just an outline. And across the middle of it was a sickle cutting through with drops of blood dripping like that. Subtle, subtle. Um, so, so sometimes people, in my opinion, do get exposure in the media. You don't want to overstate it. The outcome is that you have a media that has a very pro-business bias. What's good for business is generally thought of as good for America. Alternative policies and approaches are seldom discussed and debated. There are all sorts of feelings, uh, you know, in a democracy where, where the average citizen does not own a radio station or a TV station, uh, mass demonstrations, uh, feelings, sentiments of these sorts become the, the creative impetus for democracy. They're a feedback, they're a way that citizens can feedback and tell their government that enough is enough here or we want more of that and the other thing. Many of those kinds of protests are blacked out of the media. They're simply not allowed in. Uh, the media are generally anti-labor, non-existent. Labor is almost non-existent. U.S. interventionism abroad, uh, always, almost always supported, unless opinion turns sharply, um, unless American lives are being lost and the objective isn't being quickly uh, done. We see that kind of, we see that kind of racism ethnocentrism right now in the national discussion on Somalia. 18 U.S. Rangers were killed, 78 wounded in one fight, and suddenly 18 American lives become the most important thing that exists. No word, no debate ever about the over 1,000 Somalians who've been killed. The official figure is like 300 and something. We now know that the Belgian paratroopers massacred 200 Somalians just just uh, a few weeks ago, and it was all covered up. Um, there have been many of them killed. Uh, UN head David, uh, head of the military mission David Stockwell, is saying things like, uh, "Oh, we don't count." Or, or uh, in that one demonstration, he said the women and children were endangering the lives of the UN troops. So they had to be. That's why we shot at them. They were they were committing acts of violence or shooting at the UN troops. It's kind of disgusting and. Um, <clears throat> What's often, what's often left, uh, even when there is debate about interventionist policy, what's left 
unexamined is whether or not that policy really is coming from good intentions. Uh, the, the regular demonizing of foreign leaders. I mean, in Vietnam, you know, the debate finally came as we should get, the debate was between those who said we can win in Vietnam and those who said we can't win, so let's get out. There was no debate about all the other people, the millions of us who were marching and saying we shouldn't win, we shouldn't even be fighting, we should allow that country to develop in its own ways, make its own mistakes, and there's nothing you have that's so precious and so great that justifies your going in there and saturation bombing with B-52s and burning villages and killing men, men women, and children at the rate that you're doing and, and spraying that country with dioxide and Agent Orange and, and destroying its ecology and, 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 wreck, and wreaking that kind of havoc and murder and slaughter. There's nothing you have, no refrigerators, no general motor cars, no great free enterprise system that you have that's so magnificent that justifies your doing that to those people. And um, that, that opinion never got on the air. That opinion that we shouldn't be in the war because it was a wrong war and an immoral war was never debated. The debate was always over tactical things. We're losing too many American lives. It's too costly. It was well-intentioned, but it went awry. Good intentions gone awry. Uh, we want to bring those poor little brown and, and yellow and colored folk. We want to bring them the blessings of democracy, but they just aren't ready for it, and they don't, didn't know how to do it, so our efforts are being wasted. I mean, it's an amazing ethnocentrism there, and an amazing amount of unexamined assumptions. And often when you watch something on the media, it's not the particular things they're saying, it's the things, the immense things they're assuming and leaving unsaid that can become rather bothersome in that way. <clears throat> you, see that, you see that same kind of thing happening today with, um, in, in Russia, where the Democrats in the parliament are called hardliners, hold communist holdovers, the Constitution isn't even a legitimate Constitution. It's a Brezhnev Constitution, a Stalin Constitution. That's a lie. It wasn't the old Constitution. It was the newly amended Constitution of 1989. That parliament was entirely elected. There were no communist appointed seats. That's a deliberate confusion with the Soviet Congress, which Gorbachev abolished. The Russian Federation Congress was a, uh, uh, in 1990, every one of those guys were democratically elected, and they weren't hardliners. The hardliner was Yeltsin. He was the guy saying, we are going to put through the shock therapy reforms, the hell with the pensioners, the hell with anything else, and that's what it's going to be. And they were resisting that. They weren't resisting economic changes in the economy. They wanted, however, it modified by preserving certain human services and certain protections for the more vulnerable components of the population. That's what much of the fight is over. Some of the people in Parliament were themselves privatizers. Some of them were the first backers of Yeltsin. And here you have an image of a president tearing up the Constitution, suspending Parliament, firing tanks, 125 millimeter cannons into the parliamentary building, killing scores and scores of people, banning, uh, banning 15, no, I'm sorry, 12 political parties, suppressing and permanently suppressing something like 15 opposition newspapers, and this is called rescuing democracy. It's a rather marvelous inversion of truth. I always thought Orwell's model of, of, the, in, uh, of propaganda as being the total reversal of truth as being very crude, and I still do for the most part. That is, most propaganda doesn't simply lie, just say, you know, black is white, green is blue, or whatever else. It doesn't do that. It, it, it really more relies on framing and toning and shifts and emphasis and placement and, and, and repetition, that sort of thing, and, and omissions and that sort of thing. But, but, but that Orwellian model certainly does work, and you saw that manifested in the media, where they could take the guy who was destroying the democracy and transforming him into the guy who was saving the, the democracy. The parliamentarians who were resisting that executive action were defined as the people who were the rebels and who were threatening the government, which was a remarkable, a remarkable, one of the re remarkable propaganda feats. <clears throat> Part of it is by equating free markets with democracy. If you turn to the entertainment industry, you find the same kind of thing. In entertainment, it's a little different, though, that the politics are, are even more hidden. Um, when you see somebody get up on a, 
uh, McNeil Lair or Nightline or something, and he starts giving his rap, well, we feel this and the government policy this and we intend it. At least you know that you're listening to an interested party or you're listening to someone who is dealing with a political question. When you watch political values insinuated in entertainment, it's often hard to even detect them. I mean, you don't realize what's going on. The, the entertainment industry generally argues with Samuel Goldwyn, namely that we don't have political messages. We're in the business of entertaining people and not, um, and not propagandizing them. Samuel Goldwyn, the Hollywood producer, once said, if you have a message, go to Western Union. What he was telling writers and filmmakers, if you want to make a film like Grapes of Wrath, Salt of the Earth, uh, you know, these great dramas that, that say something about the struggles of the poor and all that, I said, you got some message like that, go to Western Union, don't do it in the films. But you know, if you watch Samuel Goldwyn's films, there's a message, there's a political message in there. You watch those films, you come away with an impression about the world and its values and all that. First of all, everybody's white except for maybe a black servant here or there, one or two. Uh, they all live in homes, and he made these movies during the Depression. They all live in homes where you'd have to have a six-figure income even then to be able to afford them. Lush homes and mansions and apartments and all that. They were, there was this glitter and glamour. Women were <clears throat> not in any kind of empowered positions at all. They always were sexual objects of one sort or another, jealous wives or flirtatious, flirtatious mistresses or whatever else. Uh, those were the Sam Goldwyn movies, or they, were, or they were these inane ladies who came down on heels and great ostrich feathers on their hairs coming down the great white way. Um, that, I maintain, is a political thing. Working people were never portrayed in any serious way. They were just usually minor characters of not of much interest. It propagated the values of glitz and glamour and consumerism, and it was consciously escapist. I mean, he consciously said, this movie's a fix. This is for people to just escape and not look at reality. Well, to consciously deny reality and get people away from reality is itself a statement about reality. The British musician and pop star, Billy Bragg, he made a point about music. I'll quote him. He said, what people mean when they say music and politics don't mix is that music and left-wing politics don't mix. Right-wing politics go right through all our music, materialistic, racist, and sexist imagery, and the dwelling on exploiting people's feelings. So the very definition, unquote, the very definition of what is a political song or a political movie is itself political. <clears throat> <coughs> And again, in the entertainment industry, I won't go on too much long, I'll, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions. In the entertainment industry, you get the same kind of thing, that and the concentration of capital, the major producers control, control and distribute most about 90% of all the films that exist. Um, <clears throat> the major producers themselves are financed by the major New York banks. So Hollywood is, it is true, Hollywood is controlled by Wall Street. <clears throat> the, uh, the people who put in te on television, the big corporate advertisers often set the limits on what can or cannot be produced. The single biggest corporate advertiser on television is a company known as Procter & Gamble. And they have an editorial policy which reads in part, I'll quote, there will be no material that may give offense either directly or by inference to any commercial organization of any sort. That means any business. There will be no material on any of our programs which could in any way further the concept of business as cold, ruthless, and lacking all sentimental or spiritual motivation. Because business is mostly motivated by spiritual and sentimental things, <laughs> as you know. Members of the armed forces must not, must not be cast as villains. If there is any attack on American customs, and they mean the dominant customs of the business culture, it must be rebutted completely on the same show. Eastman Kovac notes, quote, a spokesman, that television shows are pre screened well, I should say television shows, many television shows are pre-screened by the advertisers. And Eastman Kovac says, Quote, in programs we sponsor on a regular basis, we do preview all scripts before the airing of the program. If we find the script is offensive, we will withdraw our commercials from the program. 
And by the way, most of what they find offensive are not sexual things, but political things. What can get on now in the area of, um, uh, 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 of sex is really liberal, has been liberalized, you know, and uh, other things. Language has been liberalized, and a lot of those things have loosened up amazingly. Uh, but there's still a lot of rigorous censorship, and most of it is directed toward political. Every network has what's called a production and standards department. Production and standards is a euphemism for censor. And the production and standards guy goes through these things and they look at what is or not. And the New York Times, in one of the very rare occasions that it acknowledged that there's media censorship, see, occasionally the newspapers will acknowledge there are things that are wrong in the media if it's about television. They'll do that. They like to talk about it. Television isn't that great. So, uh, on one story, November 27, 88, they said, they noted that, <clears throat> that while network production and standards censors I'm using these words. I'll get to the quote. They've reduced their policing. Here it is. Reduced their policing of sexual and other cultural taboos. But network censors continue to be vigilant when it comes to overseeing the political content of television films. A poll taken by the Writers Guild of America, 86% of all the writers who ever wrote for television say that they experience personal censorship. Many claim that every script they have written, no matter how innocent, had been censored and diluted in some way. 81% believed that, quote, they answered yes to the quote, television is presenting a distorted picture of what is happening in this country today, politically, economically, and racially. <clears throat> and again, you're going to run into this argument, well, aren't we, giving, aren't we giving people, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff here, aren't we giving people what they want? Well, I did, there was one little study, if I could find it. Here it is, Variety, in 1983, Variety, um, actually it wasn't Variety, they published a snippet of it. There was a National Association of Broadcasters did a study. The National Association of Broadcasters are the guys who own the TV and radio industry. And they did a very exhaustive study, 5,000 respondents, which is a huge sample, plus about several hundred depth interviews, which is really, really quite a thing to do extended interviews. I mean, usually depth interviews, you know, 20 of them is, is a sample of a, of a, a, a larger sample of a, a thousand or something. It was a very exhaustive, extensive study. In-depth, I'm sorry, 500 in-depth interviews. Did I say 500? Well, it was 500 in-depth interviews. And then there were thousands of telephone interviews, or shorter ones. The study was, how do audiences feel about television? See, the argument is, they won't watch the stuff because that's what they like. We give them this because that's what they like. They don't want more serious things. And yet, you know, when, um, when Roots came on, that documentary, uh, a very serious thing, about, about, uh, a story about a uh, story of slavery. It was a docudrama, really. It wasn't a documentary. It was a docudrama. It appeared on public television. It broke all records. There was no major network that ever had audiences like that. All records, people watched it, and they were riveted, and they were fascinated. And it's true of another, a, a, a number of other quality kinds of, of, of things. When they actually get on, and when people see it in a certain framework or whatever else, it's not too alien, it doesn't seem too odd or too strange to them, they will watch it, and they will... And there's a real hunger for interesting and informative things, which can also be entertaining. It doesn't have to be dull because it's informative. And because it's important and serious, it doesn't have to be dull. It can be fascinating, you see. Okay, the NAB does this study, National Association of Broadcasters. How do you like television? And apparently Variety caught wind of it, and they said the results were overwhelmingly negative. Respondents complained that television was less entertaining than ever. About half of them said they were watching less of it than in early years. Uh, more than half wanted more relevant programs that gave audiences the chance to participate in discussion or ask questions. This was in 83. Ask questions of political figures. There were all sorts of things like this, you know. Um, what the NAB did, they refused to release the study. Five years later, in 1988, I called the National Association of Broadcasters. And I said, I asked, finally got to a person who knew something, who knew, who, who I don't know if she's one of the gatekeepers. I said, 
why haven't you released the study? Is it true that you didn't release the study because the findings were so negative in broadcasting and you didn't want your advertisers, your corporate advertisers, who you say, this is the way to the American public because they love their television sets, you didn't want them to know about it? Is that why you didn't release the study? And she said, this is the end of the interview. Clunk, and she hung up the thing. So I think maybe I had something in my question. Um, <laughs> Well, let me end right there and just say, conclusion, it's not an independent democratic media. It's not an independent democratic culture. It is a corporate class-controlled culture in many ways. Let me say that capitalism is not just an economic system. It is an entire social order. It propagates its own images, values, and myths, um, <clears throat> which often are the stuff of culture. Images, values, and myths are the stuff of culture, and capitalism, certainly corp the big Fortune 500, has a bigger say as to how that culture evolves than the democratic citizenry. And for democratic citizenry, that is a real danger and a real challenge. And what you ought to do is exercise your consumer sovereignty and not consume those soft drinks, both the soft drinks that rot your guts and the soft the soft drinks that rot your brains, the soft messages, the soft image, the soft drink images, and all that sort of thing. And what we also have to do is talk back to our television sets and our radio and support alternative media, both alternative news media and alternative um, entertainment forms. I'll end right there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Now is the part where we're all taking some questions for about 15, 20 minutes. Okay. 15 minutes? Yeah, okay, sure. 15 minutes? Anyone? Oops. Well, 80% of your commentators are conservative. Um, almost always they faithfully follow the official line, the Bush-Reagan or Clinton line, whatever it might be. So the question is, why do they think it's a liberal media? I think because the world, the reality of the world, is so at variance with what the right-wingers think it is that some information does get on the air. For the, for the media to, to have credibility, for the media to perform its class control function, for the media to be one of these stabilizing control functions against progressive change and against those who might want a fair distribution of position power and, and how wealth is used in this country, for them to faithfully control it, they have to have credibility. To have credibility, they have to sometimes deal with real issues, you see. So sometimes they do have to report things that there's a environmental problem, uh, there's a toxic waste dump here. Um, people also have what, what uh, the great Italian communist Antonio Gramsci called dual consciousness. That is, <clears throat> the larger issues, what they're thinking about, and the same thing Engels said to Marx, you want to know what the average British worker is thinking about the big issues of empire? The same thing his boss is thinking, because that's all he hears. But they also have, Gramsci said, they also have another level of consciousness, which is things in their immediate environment and their experience. So they get to things like, why are my taxes so high? What the hell am I getting for all these taxes I'm paying? Why must my kid register for the draft? Why are they sending him off to Iraq, Panama, Somalia, Lebanon, wherever else? Why is there this toxic waste dump here? Why did they take these beautiful woods in Montana, these beautiful forests, and turn them into a wasteland? How do they get away with that? What is that? So people do have questions. People do have experiences. And there's a lot of that out there. And the media has to be cognizant of that to some degree. When the Exxon Valdez, for instance, caused that disaster and, and destroyed that pristine, beautiful, that God, God created this beautiful, this beautiful coastline in Alaska, killing millions of fish and birds and otters and, uh, otters and, and, and all these creatures and, and, and destroying the whole industry there. They had to report it, you see. 
When they report that, Exxon doesn't look good. When Exxon doesn't look good, then the right-wingers say, there's the liberal media baiting and beating on the poor little corporations again. But when they reported it, who did they interview? They interviewed officials from Exxon. They interviewed government Alaska officials and a few townspeople for, townspeople for a little uh, local color, you know. Oh, it's terrible. Oh, it's a terrible man. Oh, it's really bad. I don't know what's going to happen. They never interviewed the environmental people, the environmental organizational people who have been criticizing these, these tankers for years, that they take undue risk, that they come in too close to the coast, that they overload, that they do all these things. They never, they never get the people who really have a criticism of why that happened. That thing wasn't just a natural thing that just sort of happened. But there's a whole system of interest and power behind getting as much of this oil as cheaply as possible from here to there. Um, but in the midst of all that, even though, so therefore, even though critics like myself may be dissatisfied with how the Exxon story was covered, people on the right are enraged that it was covered at all. If they had their way, if they had their way, your average newspaper would be nothing but a few glorifying stories about the wonders and blessings of private enterprise, and then a few anti-communist horror stories, you know, <laughs> what the North Koreans are doing, torturing little babies when they come out of the womb or something. And then, um, and then, um, and then some crossword puzzles and uh, cooking <laughs> recipes and, and comic strips. And by the way, that does describe a lot of newspapers in America. You know, you live in New York. When you go across the country, and it's amazing, you pick up some of these papers, and that's pretty much what they are. Now, to the extent that they aren't those things, that's when the right-wing media gets bothered. To the extent that they've got to hear an occasional bumbling comment from Tom Wicker or Bill Moyers on the media, who never goes too far over, you see, to that extent they say it's a liberal media. They forget the other 16, right? They forget William Buckley and McLaughlin and George Will and Evans and Novak and, and all these people who are talking. One or two of those people is enough, is, is something they don't tolerate. And so they call it a liberal. And by calling it a liberal media, of course, you keep the media on its guard. You keep it dressing off to the right, to dressing its right, dressing its right. You keep that kind of drum fire hitting from the right to keep pulling it, pushing it over to the right. So you change the center of gravity. That would be my answer as to how you can have these people convince it's a liberal media when in fact it isn't. <clears throat> That was, that was a good question, by the way. It really got me going, didn't it? Good question. Dr. Nelson. Any, what do you want? Dr. Parenti, um, with the death of I.F. Stone, and uh, I don't know if George Salidas is still alive in Vermont, but uh, guys like... George uh, Yes, I'm sorry. George Salidas is still alive. Anyway, um, are there any uh, journalists out there who, supposed to, who do their job diligently, as you know? Well, uh, I.F. Stone and George Seldes did do their job uh, diligently, and they never wrote for the major media. I.F. Stone, in all his life, was never even invited to the National Press Club. Did you know that? Never even he was he was red baited out of the press club, and he wasn't even a communist. Um, you know, when he got invited to speak at the press club, when he was 82 years old, about about four months before he died, he finally came in after he'd written a bestseller called *The Trial of Socrates*. Great book, by the way. Um, he decided to become an ancient Greek scholar and, and, and less of the stuff. So I would say they aren't even the exceptions to the rule. They themselves were proved, proved that if you do that kind of really investigative journalism that you attack the powers that be, you're left to write your little own independent newsletter, which might have a circulation of 20 or 30,000, but you can't reach the millions. You're not allowed. Your columns aren't syndicated. There are people who try now doing that. Jeff Cohn and my buddy Norm Solomon, they're both writing a, a column together. But they get adopted in about 20 newspapers, you know. And they, occasionally one drops them and then another adopts them and then another drops them because they get, they get a little too hard-hitting. Uh, there are a few other people like that who are trying. Jim Hightower, the Texas populist, has a radio show which is, I guess, maybe gets about 20 outlets. But you see, you, you can't... Jim Hightower is vastly more intelligent than Rush Limbaugh and, and, and vastly and, and, and really funny and witty but Rush Limbaugh has 600 radio stations that adopt him because who owns the radio stations? They're not going to take a Jim Hightower and Hightower isn't a great 
I mean, his politics aren't mine. He's kind of a li liberal populist, but he's got a lot of, and he makes, and, he, and he's got lots of little jokes, you know, not, nothing in the middle of the road except a, a, a dead armadillo with a yellow stripe down its back, and he kind of talks that fo folksy humor, which, um, um, and, and with a lot of political information, and he, and he occupied a statewide office in Texas, a very important office in Texas for a while. So, I mean, he's a public figure, he's known. Uh, I remember being on a panel with Reed Irvine of the American uh, a AIM, what is it called, uh, Accuracy in the Media. It's a right-wing uh, watchdog group. And, and Irvine is going on about how the media are a liberal conspiracy, and I said, Irvine, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute, Reed. Let's take your opinions, let's take mine. I've gotten, I've gotten two op-eds or three or four op-eds in the major media in, in 20 years. And they're usually subjects that are not the center part of what I want to say. You, you have your newspaper column in, in, uh, in, in, in 90 newspapers. He said 100. His ego was actually feeding my argument. He couldn't resist. You know, he's actually, and you have, and you have uh, 70 radio stations that carry your, your weekly radio show. He said 85 or something like that, you know. I said, I would like to be drummed out of the media the way you are. I would like to be neglected by the media. People of mine, it doesn't have to be me. I mean, actually, I don't know if I really want to turn out a column every week. But I would I'd like to see people of my persuasion drummed out of the media the way people of your persuasion are drummed out of that. Ralph Nader, who was a national figure who did all his things and led that fight with automobiles, made a national name and all. Ralph Nader has a, a syndicated column. It goes into, again, like about... 20, 25 small little newspapers, you know, one of those, sometimes it's those weekly handouts or things like that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so that's the answer. It's, it's, uh, it's not to fault the journalists and say there are no crusaders among them. Uh, the, the two late greats were, you know, Stone and Seldes. It's, it's to say that there are a lot of guys, people who want to do that, but they don't have access and they don't get the outlet. It's a controlled press, it's a censored press, it's a one-sided press. Now you might sit there, one or two, you might sit there and say, good, because I'm a conservative and I don't like liberals. And conservatives, usually by liberals, they mean everybody, liberals. I'm not a liberal, I feel I'm much further to the left than a liberal, don't, don't insult me that way, all right? So uh, we don't want people like you, commie, pinko, whatever you are, in the media. I feel better, American democracy is better, so we can sleep well and all the, God, church, mother, family is safer because you people are out of the media. I don't think so. I think democracy is safer. And by the way, I wouldn't want a media, I wouldn't want a media where everybody I read is of my opinion. I would start to get uncomfortable with that. Um, I think a democracy is much safer when you have the whole spectrum, you see, where you can really have a real variety and where you can really have real critical journalism and where you really can have a free and independent press that isn't mouthing and uh, what the official line is, but is always questioning and challenging that from several points of view. To hear two sides of a story is not to hear all sides of a story. One last question because <clears throat> my throat is going and pay isn't really that great. No, I'm joking. Why Bob Dole is Right. Do you remember when the Senate? Do you remember when the Senate majority? He's still the Senate majority. George Mitchell. You don't see. You never see him in there in any way like that. This is the Senate minority. Well, he's the head of the opposition party. But I, uh, uh, in inventing reality, I do note that coverage of Republicans is much more generous than coverage of Democrats. Forget left progressive critiques of the kind I would like to see. But even even in their own pale two party spectrum, there's an incredible bias. Even on PBS, even on McNeil Lair, even the ones that are supposed to be more liberal, you will find that the number of officials, spokespersons, whatever, are, come much more from Republican, like Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise, all those things, than from the uh, Democratic National Committee and that sort of thing. Even with a president, not even with a Democratic president in office, so they've got to find who, who's the Republicans. I mean, it's a Republican, it's a conservative media, so Bob Dole becomes Mr. Mr. Hero. And so he gets, he gets pressed like he's never gotten before. He's, he's just delirious. I mean, he's probably, 
happiest guy that George Bush, his president, got, got defeated. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions or comments? <clears throat> Can we make this the last one? Because, <clears throat> okay. I'm sure. I'd like to know what you think keeps the American public faithfully believing the myth that we're getting a full story from our media when it's true time and time again and it's just, uh, you know, it's uh, painted by other organizations? Well, uh, first of all, could I question your question? That is, there are a lot of people who are skeptical that they get the whole story <coughs> from the media. You know, they often wonder about it. They may wonder in the wrong ways, as you say, why is it a liberal media or something? But uh, they sometimes, for instance, that phony oil shortage in the mid '70s. I remember I was leafleting and uh, on it uh, mm -hmm. in front of a supermarket years ago. I do a lot of political activity besides my writing and lecturing. I, I get out in demonstrations and I do that kind of stuff. Um, I kept calling it the the, the phony oil shortage. You remember there was, it was so terrible, oil. you don't remember, you weren't, you weren't actually doing much then, but um, there was a phony oil shortage that came in the mid-70s, it was about 75, wasn't it? And suddenly there was no oil, and the price of oil got jacked up 20%, and suddenly the oil reappeared. And uh, everybody knew they'd been taken. So that's the Gramsci thing, the second, you know, we may be uninformed, but we're not stupid. We may not get access to the information. We're not completely stupid. So they do have criticism. I remember every, every time I said the phony oil shortage, it was usually a, some guy saying, you're not, you're, that's absolutely right. Some, some guy, you're not kidding, phony. You're right. We got taken. So they know. They know that they're not. They sometimes know they're not being told the truth. Why they don't know when they're being lied to all the time? Well, you know, they often don't have alternative sources of information. So it's amazing how you can manipulate people sometimes. I remember a few years ago going around the country and everybody was Qaddafiing. Qaddafi, 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 Libya, Qaddafi, because it was in the media. And everybody was sitting around, Qaddafi, Qaddafi, Qaddafi going to come, Qaddafi, Qaddafi going to get your mama, Qaddafi, <laughs> watch out for Qaddafi, you know? And uh, I said, wait a minute, Qaddafi's head of a little country with three million people. You really think that's a moral danger to the United States? And, and a few months from now, when Gaddafi drops from, from, the, from the media, you're going to be still talking, Gaddafi, Gaddafi, I can't sleep, Gaddafi, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> and then it was Noriega, Noriega, Noriega. I mean, wait a minute, Noriega was in bed with the CIA, he was doing this. The one day he decided he didn't want to do any more of this stuff for the, against the Sandinistas, and Bush decided he had to go, and they wanted to reassert their power in Panama, and, and the Panamanian Defense Force was kind of a left military force, and left means that it was doing things like putting in social security programs and a few other things. I mean, Noriega was a populist. There were, there were people in Panama, black, poor, who now were moving into positions of responsibility, you know, people who under the old system could never have hoped that. Noriega had learned something from Torres, and even if he wasn't like Torres, whose plane mysteriously blew up in midair, compliments of the CIA, some of us firmly believe. Uh, Noriega still had a military around him, still had to operate in that, that, that sort of thing. And that was his sin, really. But suddenly he was the worst demon that ever existed. Noriega, Noriega was a drug dealer. And we say, we gotta stop him because he's a drug dealer. Drug dealer? Ramon Rodriguez appeared before Senator Carey's committee and said, they're all doing it. The, the, they say, uh, Senator D'Amato said to him, who's dealing in drugs? You know, D'Amato is a style, he asked him. Who's dealing in drugs, what you say? He said, how much did you deal with? He said, well, Senator, I dealt with about, I dealt with about um, $100 million in cash every week. $100 million in cash. Can you imagine the size of this guy's suitcases? He said, how did you get in and out of the country? What are the customs, you know? Tomato, he's so, and the guy, Rodriguez says, Senator, you know, when you got $100 million, you don't go through customs. They have limos and helicopters waiting for you. And he said, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so then they, so then Senator Kerry said, I'm so sharp, that Tomato. <laughs> Senator Kerry says, uh, and who did you deal with in those countries? And Rodriguez says, we dealt with the executive heads and the military chiefs of Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and he went on and on and on. And, and then Kerry says, 
we won't take the names, we'll get the names of them in, in secret executive session. I said, oh, right, Senator Curry, because right, you and I are not old enough to hear the names. We might get upset <laughs> and we would cry and we don't want to, oh, you know. That was a Noriega, and so they get Noriega, and people are led to believe Noriega was a drug czar. The guy is doing 20 years in an American prison now. You actually had an American president announcing that this guy was violating an American law that's operative in an American jurisdiction in Panama. So we can now go down, arrest him, use an armed force, kill 3,000 Panamanians, they take him, bring him back to New York, rig the trial. He can't talk about President Bush and his relations with President Bush. The judge rules on the first day. That's not relevant, national security. And he goes to jail for progressive law. By that rule, we can, we, by that rule, the Muslims can kill George Bush for violating Muslim, sacred Muslim law in uh, Saudi Arabia, couldn't they? And say he has been violating our laws, we can kidnap him, bring him back to Saudi Arabia, and you know what they do there? <clears throat> Take his hands off, that's all, a fair, after a fair trial. <laughs> well, that's my answer to your question. I mean, people can, it's really frightening how uh, too many of our compatriots can easily be thought that it, they, they can demonize. That's where I think entertainment media and news media interlock. One of the chapters I did in Make Believe Media was uh, on, on children's television. I called it Child Abuse was the title of the, the chapter. And you have the Saturday morning massacres, you know, and you look at these cartoons one after the other, other and the cartoons are always about some, some foreign demon threat that's going to come. One of them were the invading brains from outer space. Brains, you know, like brains in your head. The invading giant brains. And there were these disembodied brains floating in space, shooting laser beams down and, and paralyzing and killing people. Why did the brains do that? Because that's what they like to do. That's what these brains do. And, and there's this, always this sinister menace, you know, of one kind or another from some outer space or some, or some foreign guy with a funny accent and a darker complexion. These are cartoons that children are watching who talks like that, oh, we're going to get these people. <laughs> and then there are the heroes. There are the adventure superheroes who come, and the danger is stopped by the application of force and violence. The, this, impen this violent threat is stopped by a counter-violence, and it's hard to tell you know, the good guy violence from the bad guy violence, and, and the whole thing is resolved, and everybody is safe. The people play no active role as active agents in their lives. They're just the victims. They run and scream. The Godzilla movies, right? Godzilla reappears periodically to impose his urban renewal program on downtown Tokyo. <laughs> and he... And they finally have to shoot and kill and, and get him. Then he goes back in the ocean only to reappear a few years later when the Japanese filmmakers got nothing better to do. Um, that's exactly what our foreign policy is. We are now told the kami menace is over. These immutable, relentless, totalitarian, brutal, violent communists who folded up their whole system the minute 100,000 people marched out in the street. I thought it was very impressive. I thought, gee, I wish we could do that in Guatemala or El Salvador or places like that. Um, and, um, and now we hear from our leaders, there's a world of adversaries out there. Just because the communists are gone, don't mean there's a world of adversaries who apparently a few years ago they had overlooked, but are now out there, you see. And so we need all this military, we need all that. And they're right, there are adversaries. In all those countries, there are people who are fighting for the left against the right. Now, what does left and right mean? Are these two mystical global cults that you belong? I will belong to the left or the right. The left means these are the people on the side of the peasants and the workers and the poor priests in Latin America and the intellectuals and the student leaders who want social change who want to change their country where 80% of the land belongs to six rich families and the rest of the people live in massive poverty, where the country is thrown open by the comprador class to foreign investors who could come in and take the land at which they raised beans and rice to feed themselves and convert that into sugar and coffee export crops. You see, this is, uh, that's the left. The right is made up of the military, the generals, the big latifundio owners, the whorehouse operators and gamblers, and, and, and the foreign investors, that's the right. So you choose, if you, think, if you think you feel funny about the left, you don't like the term, call them something else. Call them uh, little guys or whatever you want or, 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 or whatever. Um, but that's what the fight 
That's what the fight's about. And I know which side I have chosen, and I hope you choose likewise. Bye-bye. I'd just like to say we're serving refreshments with soft drinks in the faculty <laughs> lounge. Soft drinks. I'm bringing my water with me. Okay, Michael Parenti, it's been 25 years since 1968, a year many consider uh, the revolutionary year in this century. Uh, where do you think the left has gone in those 25 years? Where is the left now? And where would you like the left to go? <clears throat> well, what we call the left is a very uh, multivariegated uh, group of people. There are all sorts of people consider themselves part of the left. The left means moving toward progressive political change, a fair distribution of power, a fair distribution of wealth. Um, <clears throat> and the left is now, of course, um, elements of it have, are in decline compared to what things were in the 19, late 1960s. But in other ways, uh, people have advanced. That We are looking at the fact that Columbus didn't discover America, but he invaded it. He led an invasion of it. We are looking at the fact that uh, US interventionism is not benignly intended, but it often does things that are terrible for human beings, both here and abroad. <coughs> um, so the left, I think, has developed more, more critiques. Uh, years ago, the view was that US policy was stupid and tragically misled. And today, at least there are some of us on the left who argue that US policy is quite rational and remarkably successful in its ability to, uh, to stop social change and overthrow creative and progressive governments to try to give a fairer shake to their people, whether it be in Nicaragua or, or governments or movements. Like Nicaragua, El Salvador, Angola, Mozambique, uh, and uh, any number of other places, East Timor, where the, uh, the effects have been terrible. And so our criticism of US policy is not that it's a failure, but that it's a tragic and horrible and unjust success. Um, <clears throat> there is, unfortunately, among many people on the left, a McCarthyism, an anti-communism of the left. I know when I decided I would not join in the chorus of red baiting and Soviet bashing that went on, and in fact, I wrote articles for the uh, Communist Party USA publications, I found myself often red baited by other people on the left who are so worried about their credibility and legitimacy that they begin to practice a McCarthyism. And I'm not using the term allegorically. I mean literally a McCarthyism, um, opposing appointments to jobs, uh, not inviting you for uh, seminars or panels or whatever else, uh, disassociating, disassociating themselves, declining your articles for publication, and all that sort of thing. That is, there's a real. McCarthyism on the left among some people who profess to be on the left. So you do have these various shadings. Uh, much of the left in America is really like much of the liberals has, has that same problem of worrying, uh, leaning toward the center and worrying about their respectability and their credibility. And um, I don't worry about my credibility. I think the best way to have credibility is to speak what you think is the truth as forcefully and as clearly and as strongly as possible. By strongly and forcefully, I don't mean in volume. I mean by marshalling up the arguments and evidence that support that position. If you can't marshal them up, there must be something wrong with the position. Um, there still are people on the left who play active roles in public interest groups. Uh, we have had, even though it's you, the usual way is to see the left in decline since the 60s. We have had some remarkable victories. The growth of the environmental movement, uh, it's not a victory, it's a hopeful thing. The nuclear freeze movement, which was a massive movement, um, 
<clears throat> the fight today for health care and things of that sort. Um, it's not easy because the power is with those who control the high ground in our institutions and in our corporations and the people who have the money. And so they really, uh, they, we're having a hard time. You mentioned several cases of U.S. intervention or U.S. sponsored terrorism. How does the current situation in Somalia and the current situation in Haiti fit into uh, the U.S foreign policy goals? Well, in Somalia, the real goal was, of course, to make Somalia safe for the oil corporations. Um, I should have mentioned that in the talk here. The mainstream media have totally ignored the story about oil in Somalia. There was one remarkable article, January 18, 1993, in the LA Times, which said, that three-fourths of Somalia had been conceded by the former ruler to four major American oil companies, Conoco, Amico, Phillips, and whatever, and um, that they strongly believe that there are major oil depos deposits in Somalia. George Bush, when he was vice president in 86, went around in Yemen and other places saying that that whole region, the whole Cape, uh, the Horn of Africa, was very rich in oil, and they thought Somalia had really a lot of it. This explains his strange behavior as President of the United States to suddenly send troops into Somalia out of the conviction that, this, that he wanted to feed the Somalians. Now, the Somalians have had a famine for 10 years. He never moved his troops once. The Somalians, uh, there are about 12 nations in Africa that have had drought and famine for over a decade, he hasn't done a thing. He hasn't done a single thing for any of them. So why now is he suddenly so moved that he actually sent troops? And how do you feed people with troops? You know, Why do you need troops to feed them? Well, supposedly the warlords, were, the warlords were stealing all the food for themselves or something like that. And in fact, the drought in, and, and the, uh, the famine in Somalia was alleviating. They'd had a good crop that year. That's the other irony, not irony, but hypocrisy of it. Well, once the troops were sent, there wasn't a single U.S. official or corporate executive who ever once again mentioned oil. The word was dropped. Didn't tell anybody. And that explains why, why Clinton is so reluctant to leave. It's not that he might look bad. Or that's why he went in the first place, and that's why he's keeping the troops. He's continuing with Bush. There's oil there, man. And when there's oil, uh, then U.S. policy becomes an instrument of the oil corporations. In fact, when the first troops arrived, they used Conoco's headquarters for their command post. And they paid Conoco rent to use the headquarters. Imagine if it was just a school or some other institution, you know, public institution. They'd come in and just take it over and use it. But with Conoco, they paid them rent. So the American taxpayer is paying for these troops to go there to protect Conoco's oil and then paying Conoco rent to house them. Uh, it's a very good system if you're an oil company. In Haiti? In Haiti, I think what you have is the embarrassment that a democratically elected president is overthrown by the military, which is protecting that same ruling class and foreign investors that, that George Bush and Bill Clinton protect. However, what you have in Haiti is a surplus of, of repression. And what the CIA, I just heard that the CIA is down there talking to the military heads. I think that's very interesting. They've got to clean up their act. That is, how to, how to um, control Haiti so that there's no real democratic change for the masses of poor people, which is what Aristide is interested in doing. How to bring Aristide back in, because he was democratically elected by these people, but keep him very confined. And by the way, if he, become, if he does go back, and he does become more effective, and he does start mobilizing people again for change, he'll be blown away this time. They won't, they won't let him walk out with some French ambassador. Um, how to do that but make it look okay. Don't, don't come across looking like a bunch of cutthroat gunmen, which is what they're doing now. So I think that's what it is. The UN observers in the US were going to come down like window dressing. They, want to, they even talked about we have to professionalize the police in Haiti. Professionalizing the police means be more selective in how you repress. 
Don't just go over to some store owner and blow his head out because you think he might be from the other side or something. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really all the intervention is in regard to Haiti. It's, it's to how to prevent the social change, not to help it along. Professor, how does this intervention compare to what happened, say, in Chile under Allende and uh, in Guatemala under Jacobo Arben, uh, excuse me, Arbenz? Which intervention? The Haitian intervention. Uh, you just said that they, they um, are trying to clean up their act. Why didn't they do that when they uh, assassinated uh, Arbenz and Allende? I think with Allende, too much was at stake. I mean, the, um, Allende was head of what was called a popular unity government, which was a broad base of a variety of political parties, all of which were doing things like helping the poor. And there had been taken place in Chile a shift of national income, that huge portion that went to people who don't work in the form of interest and dividends. And a, a bigger portion of that went to people uh, who work for wages and salaries. So there was a democratization of the economy and a bettering. The military there uh, moved very decisively and killed Allende. You didn't have the problem of a live president walking around, coming to the US. Uh, Aristide is a, is a problem, you see. When he got away, you can bet there were some guys in, Yang, in, in uh, Langley, Virginia, in the CIA, who were very, very upset. Now that he's around, he becomes a living symbol of the undemocratic oppression, the overthrow of democracy. Allende was killed. All his people were rounded up, and that was that. Um, the, go you see, the goal in all these countries is to, uh, ideally, to keep that existing social structure where 2% of the people own 80% of the land, where they control everything, where they open it up to foreign US corporate investors to make as much profit off they can off the cheap labor in those countries and the re natural resources in the land and all that stuff, but to legitimate it with a veneer of democracy, a, a window dressing of democracy. So now you even have in Chile, Pinochet's constitution is in power, where you have democratic parties in and a prime minister, and they say, democracy has returned to Chile. Well, it's not really true. The constitution also says that the military will have its own budget and decide its own budget and its own policies. And, if, and that military at any time is, un, is totally unaccountable to the civilian authorities, and it could come in it could come in and, and uh, blow the whistle again and, and, and do the bloodletting again, which has happened repeatedly in Argentina. You know, every so often, then they finally hold elections again because the people agitate and fight. And then all the, all the popular forces come to the fore. They legitimate, they lay down their arms, they start working in organizations. Boom, then comes another coup. You round them up, put them against the wall, kill them all again, and, and this goes on until people get very cynical about the democracy. And I think that's what's got to happen in Haiti. What they want to do is tame it so they're not just killing. I mean, you have, you have even people, like people on Nightline, upset about it. Because you see, some of these people really believe that US policy has something to do with helping democracy. So they get upset. They say, well, those bodies are really stacking up in Haiti. What's going on? Why should we not help Aristide? Or what's that military all about? And Clinton can't turn around and say, hey, the function of that military is to do with the function of the military everywhere, which is to make the world safe for the Fortune 500, to make the world safe for the big corporate investors, and to make the world safe not only for just direct investment, but to make sure that no alternative system comes in, a system that wants to use the land, the labor, the resources, and the capital of the country in a different way <coughs> rather than in the private profit way. I'd like to continue on Haiti and quote from today's New York Times, Tuesday, October 19th, headline, Clinton vows to fight Congress on his power to use the military. President Clinton, trying to protect his power to control the use of military force, vowed today to strongly oppose efforts by members of Congress to restrict his authority, to commit troops, to restore democracy in Haiti, or to work with the United Nations in other global hotspots. Is it's it? The, it's the other. Is I was going to say, is it uh, Bill Clinton's choice to send U.S. troops? Uh, what about the American people? Well, let's get something clear. Clinton has not said he would use troops in Haiti to restore democracy. Okay. The minute those Haitian gunmen came out and started terrorizing the uh, U.S. 
members of that peacekeeping force, they tucked their tail, got in the back in the boat, and got it back on, got in the car, got back on the boat. And nobody was saying our credibility, our image, our willingness to show that we're strong the way they're doing in Somalia. So they're not exactly knocking themselves out for Aristide. And he isn't sending any troops to Haiti. So this whole argument is an attempt by the Republican right to use Haiti as a way of getting, keeping them out, keep, keep, keeping the US out of Haiti to help Aristide. They don't want to help Aristide. Um, the general principle is correct. I agree that Congress should have a greater control over the US president, that the president should not be getting us into wars. The Constitution, Article 1, uh, Article 1 says that Congress shall have the power to declare war. <clears throat> and what we're getting is presidents unilaterally going in, fighting whole wars that have never even been declared, never been debated or discussed, where Congress can't even find out when the troops, how many troops are there, why they sent, how long are they going to be there, and all that sort of thing. Uh, that, my friends, are not a democracy. That's not a democracy. That's not the way you run things. Um, <clears throat> we're not talking about quick emergency action where something has to happen instantly. There, there's no quick emergency action. There was no thing that they had to suddenly send all these troops to Somalia or, or, or even bother with Haiti or, or Bosnia or whatever else. I was thinking that the policy in Haiti might be one where they will allow the country to sink so far down the toilet, they will then allow Aristide to come back and he'll be able to do nothing because there will be nothing left and then they will point to Aristide and say, see what happens when you allow leftists in power? Well, that's already, I mean, you, you, Haiti is as far down. <clears throat> I mean, they even talk about not third world countries, but fourth world countries, that Haiti is one of the fourth world that is, it, it's, uh, the term is not poverty, it's called absolute poverty or desperate poverty, where, you know, there are degrees of poverty too, and Haiti is, is way down there already. And um, most certainly that was the argument used against Allende in Chile or Arbenz in Guatemala, that uh, in those cases they had the rationalization that there was a communist influence uh, with our Benz in Guatemala, they said uh, he was friendly to the communists, or he was the first democratically elected president of Guatemala. His real sin was that he started taking some of the unused land of the United Fruit Company and distributing it to peasants. And United Fruit Company doesn't like that. And they're the power, one of the powers, they're now United Brand, they've merged. Um, they were the power there, and the CIA went in and overthrew him and bragged about it and said, because he was a communist, you could do that. There's a lot more consciousness today about what gives us the right, what gives this country the right to go into any country it wants to and dictate who shall or shall not be its leader. We can go in, kill thousands of the people, pluck the guy out, bring him back to the U.S. and try him on a trumped-up drug charge uh, with Noriega, for instance, as I talked in the lecture. Uh, and what gives... What gives the leaders of this country, I don't want to say this country or us Americans, because most Americans are not clamoring, let's go in, let's go fight here, let's go fight here. Most Americans, if you ask them, are clamoring about, hey, how about helping our schools and our public hospital that's going to be closing, or the library that you got closing now, or uh, fix up these roads or the environment, whatever else. That's what most people in this country are concerned about. And these leaders are really they're like the they're like the hitmen for the Fortune 500. Increasingly, our capital and our jobs are getting export, exported abroad, and they have to watch out for the interests of these companies abroad. So we get it both ways. One, our jobs are exported, our factories are exported, and two, we have to pay the taxes for this global empire. And three, we, th this also leads to a colossal neglect at home to the infrastructure at home. There are certain terms of political discourse that are often not used. One is class, another is propaganda. That's something that the other guys always do. And another is ideology. Do you think that there is a, a U.S. ideology? Yeah, I just wrote a new, I just wrote a book called Land of Idols, Political Mythology in America. And the opening line is something like, I don't exactly remember it, but it's something like, one of the ideological teachings in the United States is that our country is uniquely free of ideology. That itself is an ideological presumption because in fact we're not free. We, there, there, there are all sorts of ideologies which have to do with the, the blessings of the free market, uh, anti-communism, all these other things. Uh, 
that whenever the U.S. intervenes abroad, it's defending the interests of the American people, which I don't believe it is. It's helping those poor little brown and black and yellow people in those other countries, which I don't think it does. Uh, so those are all ideological and propaganda uh, overviews as to, you know, the, the ideological fate in individualism as defined, and I believe in individual choice and individual way, but, but defining individualism as meaning you go through life and you got to go it alone and devil take the hindmost and grab all that you can of, that's yours, you know, the, the whole ideology of greed, the whole ideology of, uh, of, um, of self-interest. And I'm not against self-interest. In fact, one of my arguments is that the American people, their self-interest is being violated, that they often are voting for leaders who do not serve their self-interest, but who serve other interests. But um, so there are a lot of different kinds of ideologies in America. There are racist views. A lot of it, a lot of it doesn't have the status of ideology in that it is explicitly formulated the way an ideology is. A lot of it is implicit and just said with certain coded words and images. I'd like to take a radical leap. Uh, I think this is tied to the notion of ideology, uh, sports in America. Uh, the World Series is taking place now. I just heard that four million people watched baseball games in Denver, Colorado this year. 60 million people watched the Super Bowl. What role do you think sports plays in U.S. ideology? Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with sports. Sports are great. Uh, sports are a wonderful human activity. They're one of the few activities people do where they're not doing each other in, well, I wouldn't say maybe football occasionally, somebody does get badly hurt. But, uh, and sports have always been important in almost every society, from Native American Indians, ancient Greeks, Rome, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but you can certainly do an analysis of the way sports are very much linked to patriotism. During the Gulf War, for instance, Bush was insistent, no, we won't suspend the Super Bowl, let's have it, and all that. And he got down there, and, and during the part-time break, you had all these American flags and the Army, Navy, and Air Force coming out, and the celebration and the linking of national sports with national military, uh, the same terminology is used. The military adopts all the sporting terminologies for it. Um, during the Cold War, it was terrible the way that propaganda went on. When, when Nazi Germany did this in the Berlin Olympics in the 30s, we all said, ooh, that Hitler, what is he using the sports for political purposes? But Jesus, all oh, the Olympics, were, that, that's the way it was done. We beat the Russians and all. And when, the, when that Soviet basketball team beat the American team back in, when it was that, 1988, 89, my God, I remember watching NBC acting like it was the end of civilization as we knew it. Talked about a Soviet juggernaut that relentlessly came forward, grinding away at our brave American players, a team that was hobbled by injury, as if the other team had, had no injuries. Um, it made it sound like they were fighting the Red Army instead of a basketball team, you know. So, so in that sense, there is a kind of a propagandistic thing that, that can often come in. Another thing about sports is, is uh, it's amazing in the media how much time is given to it. I mean, they're reporting, the, e the 11 o'clock news I mean, sports get, gets a time segment that's, that's about as big as the news itself. And um, <clears throat> also, the definition of sports, the distorting effects that this has on sports itself, where sports becomes defined as a mass spectator sport, that you get masses of people collected to watch these key performers, when in fact sports should be something that people themselves are doing. So what we should have is more intramural sports and those kind of things, and less big-time stardom, star sports. And the, the effect of the media is to do that very same thing, is to, is to turn it into a big business where the players are treated like uh, hunks of meat on the hook, in that sense. <clears throat> Professor, can you give our audience a, an example of the types of impediments to democratic social change that exist? Um, sports would be one of them. When people worry about sports scores, they're not worrying about other s more important social issues. Can you think of anything else like that? Yeah, well, let me say something, one more thing about sports, that what sports do is hijack our loyalties to a high-paying, high-powered team that's put together by a multimillionaire 
uh, and rather than our loyalties, say, going, and our energies and attention. I mean, because you can find, you can find, when I did in Washington, D.C., you could find people on the street who knew, who could name the whole redskin defensive line and the hogs, the offensive line in the backfield, and who was this, and, and can give you, and could talk for two hours perfectly informed about sports and who didn't know a thing about politics. So it is a way of depoliticizing people, of distracting people. They said about ancient Rome, you gave them a little bit of the bread and you gave them a lot of circuses too to keep them happy and keep them distracted while we fleeced them and did really very little for them. So that's the function of sports. The other impediments of social change, the answer in one word is everything. I mean, just almost everything. Much of what goes on in our schools, much, much of what goes on in all these institutions, they are designed most definitely not to get people to become the active social agents of their own lives, not to get people, the police, I mean, look what the police did to democratic community organizations in the, from the late 60s to the 70s. Most of those Puerto Rican and black leaders in Chicago who were starting, the Panthers and all who were starting those community organizations, those could have been very vital democratic organizations. Those communities would have been in a lot better shape than they are today. Most of those leaders are either in Marion prison or they're dead now. And the demoralization that took place in those communities, and not long after that, the drug traffickers came in. And those drug traffickers were helped by the feds who brought them right in there and helped distribute that stuff. Uh, because it is much safer and much better to have the poor demoralized and disorganized rather than having them well-organized, literate, moving with real leadership and getting a fairer slice of the pie. That's the whole idea. Every dollar I got to pay to workers is one less dollar in my pocket. Every dollar I got to pay to people uh, in a community is one less dollar in, in my pocket. That's the bosses, that, that, that's, the, that's the owning class's view. So it was much better f to have them demoralized. Crime becomes an instrument of social control. Crime actually is a way of keeping the community demoralized. The, uh, the slums are not a problem the slums are the solution. That's where you pack in the so-called underclass, the losers, and you keep them down there. That's where you keep your cheap labor reserve and, and the surplus people. Um, what it tells us is that there's an, inherent, there's an inherent contradiction and tension between capitalism and democracy, that the more democracy works, the, the, the angrier capitalism would, will get. There's nothing we ever got. It's not capitalism that gave us this good life. In 1898, when you had the freest, most untrammeled capitalism, it was, it was not a good life. People were dying of typhoid in Philadelphia. Children were working in factories 13 hours a day, little 10-year-olds. That was not a good life. To the extent that we that life has improved, it wasn't because anything, ca but despite what the big plutocrats and big money guys were doing, it was, had to fight for an eight hour day, had to fight for the right to collect a bargain, had to fight for social security and pensions, had to fight for clean drinking water, for free public education, public education. All those things had to be fought for. And that kind of fight is still going on today. And that's the fight of, de of democracy. Democracy is a wonderful invention of the people of history. It goes back to ancient Greece, an invention by the people of history to protect themselves against the power of wealth. <clears throat> and that's the fight that's still going on to this very day. And let's keep fighting. <laughs>